On a frigid December evening, as the city lay cloaked in snow, my sister Kate appeared at my door, her gaze tinged with a shadow known only to those who have battled cancer for a decade. Her once vibrant body was now a faded silhouette of what it once was, slowly consumed by an implacable disease. She accepted hospice care like an old acquaintance, as if returning to a place she had visited before but never fully explored. And so started our last chapter. No unanswered questions, just the solemn realization that we were on an irreversible journey. The room with its white walls and the ticking clock set the stage for our silent farewell. In the midst of darkness, a sudden light. One night, as the wind howled and snow danced under the moon, my sister briefly vanished, not physically, but into the unknown, where boundaries blurred. In that limbo, I sensed something greater, ancient, and indescribable. It was not a dream, nor a fantasy born of fatigue or pain. It was a tangible encounter with absence, a wordless conversation with reality itself. And as my heart beat in unison with the ticking of the clock, I felt my sister's hand squeeze mine, as if to reassure me that everything would be okay, despite the storm raging outside. And so, as days turned into weeks and weeks into months, we continued our journey together through the highs and lows of a disease that knew no mercy. Until that fateful day, January 25th, 2023, when the clock stopped and silence enveloped the room like a fresh sheet of snow. Kate lived until January 25th, unresponsive in her final days. A friend supported me greatly staying with me on her last two nights. Neither of us slept much. We didn't want to as she neared death. Around 7 a.m. on January 25th, my friend left for rest. Closing the door behind her, I returned to find Kate in the living room. I initially sat on the couch but felt compelled to be closer, so I moved towards her. As I rose from the couch, the number 842 lit up like a digital alarm in the air before me, in large red numbers. The TV had been off for days, no computers were on, and I didn't have an alarm set. I dismissed it immediately because it meant absolutely nothing to me, and I had Kate on my mind. It was very unsettling to be alone with her knowing she might die with me right there. I sat by her hospice bed, aware that our time together was fleeting, listening to her labored breaths, watching her chest rise and fall. I felt grateful for her smooth forehead, devoid of stress or pain. There were subtle expressions, a moment of puzzlement, a faint furrow or nod. It was as if I could sense her needs without words. It was as if she knew she was about to leave but didn't know how, which way to go, and wanted me to go with her. The Thursday before, she had said she felt, we'll leave together, but I told her I wouldn't die yet. I told her her death would make me feel that way, but I wouldn't go with her. I knew little about it. So I rearranged the chair, dropped the bed rail, and leaned in with my mouth right next to her ear. First, I sang, or hummed, the song Tula 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 that our father had sung when she was stung by a bee when she was about five years old. It's an old African lullaby. He put it on her shoulders and ran along the beach for help, all while humming that song. It was incredibly soothing and caring, and I hadn't even thought about it for many, many years. But there it was, pouring gently from my mouth straight into her ear. From there, it was just a situation where somehow I knew what to say and what to do. I didn't have a plan on how to do it. I had no idea what I would say or do or what to expect. Yet I knew what I was doing, what needed to be done for Kate. I had no idea this was possible and I wasn't stressed or emotional. This was happening, and I was doing it. I was aware that the living room had vanished. Everything was a light gray, insignificant, and both her body and mine were only visible from the head and upper chest. Then it was as if I went deeper and we found ourselves on a dirt road. The road was unpaved and smooth, with no rocks or potholes. We were just there. There was neither landing nor arrival. We were simply there. 
I sensed her stress and tension, knowing she was anxious. Yet, I remained calm, almost smiling, reassuring her she could walk without pain or fear. As she tested her steps, relief and joy washed over her. I pointed out the gentle slope of the road ahead, our path to walk. It wasn't paved, just a comforting, light-colored dirt road. At the road's start, a stripe adorned its center like a real one, but it vanished as we felt united, gazing into the distance. Both sides were adorned with plants and flowers, gradually fading as we walked slowly. Initially, soft hues surrounded us, but the focus shifted to our companionship and colors dissolved. Despite the lack of vibrant hues, the surroundings remained solid, not transparent. I told her that this was the way to walk, that if she looked far away, she would see what looked like a big black gate that wasn't solid, but with vertical bars through which you could see. On each side of the gate was a square white pillar, but nothing beside the gate pillars. No landscape, no terrain, no road or fence. Give me a minute, she said. She often said that when she got out of bed, etc., and needed to get used to something new, to a new movement or situation. She took her time, and then I encouraged her to keep walking slowly, that I was right there with her and would stay with her throughout the journey. I didn't touch her at all, nor did she touch me. I wasn't supporting her. She was standing solid. We didn't look at each other the whole way or touch each other in any way, but her thoughts and feelings were known to me. I was aware that our bodies were intact, but I didn't look to see my legs or feet. I knew and saw that she stood up and walked smoothly. Also, I wasn't aware of what we were wearing or that we were putting one foot in front of the other. Somehow, we moved on this road. I told her that behind those gates were all her people, people who wanted her to go with them and who were all excited that she was coming. Give me a minute she said a little breathlessly as she slowed down a bit more. I gently took a little more time to encourage her, and then I told her to look at that gate, which had become much closer. Look at all the people there behind waiting for you. Give me a minute, please, she said softly. So we stood for a while, relaxing and letting her feel more comfortable with this process and with the progress we were making towards the gate. I could see that there were people there, but not individually at this point. I didn't feel rushed or that we had a time frame to reach the gate. It was all under her control. As we approached, now I could see all the people I knew who had died before her, standing on the other side of that huge closed gate. There were no walls or fences on both sides of the gate, only the gate and nothing beside it. Our attention was focused on the gate and now the people behind it. They stood there silently, with their arms along their sides, but with so much understanding and patience emanating from all of them. There were so many people we had known there, and they all looked only at Kate. I was glad that everyone was looking at her because it was all about her, and I was here just to help. I didn't feel any negative feelings for not being noticed by my family and friends, just happiness for Kate to be welcomed in this way. Kate took a deep, steady breath and asked for another minute. We were in absolute peace in front of this dense group of people, and we were immersed in it. I could almost feel Kate happy now. Her shoulders were relaxed, and I could feel her peace. After a while, I whispered to her if she was already ready and to make sure to take the next step only when she was fully ready. It glanced back halfway over its left shoulder and asked, Can I say goodbye to you one more time? Of course, I said as she took a couple of steps forward and I stayed where I was. Then her left hand rose, bent at the elbow and wrist, and she waved to me with a casual, happy, and relaxed gesture as she continued to walk forward, now with a spring in her step. When her left hand finished its farewell and descended again, her right hand reached out to the crowd in front of her, and the last steps were much faster, confident, and assured. She took that step beyond the gate opening, and I saw everyone start to greet her with so much joy and comfort. It was as if a surprise party had been arranged for her with people she would never have expected and hadn't seen in centuries. 
The greetings were so full of joy. It was all so gentle, so peaceful, and so right. As I watched her being welcomed and mingling with everyone present, a very thin line formed in the ground along the gate opening. It was a line as thin as a hair, delicately undulating, which became an empty space that grew and grew as everything behind that gate slowly and gently moved away from me, and a mist gently covered everything. It was a bit like continents drifting apart, I thought. It seemed that the part that was moving away had a bluish hue, but again, I couldn't see the color. I just felt it. Kate never looked back again. This made me happy because I knew without a doubt that she didn't need to look back, to want to be here anymore, that she would be fine. That gate never closed as I watched everything move away. I heard a voice in my head saying, it was a job well done. It wasn't a male or female voice, just a kind and gentle voice. Knowing that I had done what Kate needed me to do, that she needed help, security, and companionship for this last journey here on Earth, made me feel at peace, and I was deeply grateful to have been the one to walk that last path with her. I felt so deeply in awe of what I had just experienced. Immediately afterward, I had the sensation of being to the left of where I was before, and I saw a fog or cloud come and envelop me in a cocoon, it was extremely relaxing, and I felt a deep calm and peace infuse me. As I was in this cocoon, I was aware of standing upright, suspended, but completely relaxed and calm. And then I felt a slight pop, and I was back beside Kate's bed in my living room still leaning over her. The gray mist was gone, and everything was back again. I could hear the cats, dogs, and outside noises again. Looking up, I noticed that the sun was bright and my eyes caught the clock on the wall. As I noted the time, I looked back down at Kate as her final breath brushed my face. It was 842. That was the number 842 I had seen when this experience began. At first, I didn't realize how much time had passed because time wasn't an issue during this experience. After about one hour and 40 minutes, my back no longer hurt from leaning over her bed. I didn't feel any discomfort. Only a couple of months later, when I recounted it to my son, did he note the time that had passed. Losing my sister was devastating. We were extremely close, only 365 days apart in age, intimate friends, confidants, and supporters of each other in every part of our lives. Together we lived an adventure during our life together, many unusual experiences where what happened to her subsequently happened to me and vice versa, almost like extensions of each other, even in appearance. This experience somehow made it a little less painful, allowing me to face life here, knowing absolutely that she is well. I've had some other experiences with her and a visual visit after her death that show me that she is still close and encourage me to move forward to live my life to the fullest. I feel compelled to utilize this experience, along with others, to aid individuals confronting fear as they approach the threshold of death. Unaware of the existence of shared death experiences initially, this revelation opened a new realm of understanding. I've come to realize that I underwent a distinct shared death encounter with an ex-husband years ago, albeit without comprehending its nature at the time. It wasn't until I delved into my experience with Kate that I unearthed similar accounts, such as those documented by Judy Hilliard exploring Celtic traditions of Anam Cara and Anam Era, wherein souls are accompanied to the other side. An interesting aspect of this experience for me is that it didn't show me anything. No beautiful colors, angels, beings, lights, beautiful music, visions, no tunnel or message to bring back, teach me, or guide me. It was, as that voice said, a job for which I had to do, for which I was chosen or chose to do, a privilege I am deeply honored and, to be honest, totally admired to have been able to do it. Being able to see that Kate, my dear sister, my other half, is safe and happy is an invaluable gift.